Welcome to Home Dad Chat, brought to you by the National At Home Dad Network. My name is Brock. My name is Danny. We are here to talk about life as stay at home dads. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. No, I don't want much. I even love handmade crafts made of macaroni. Come on now, you should know me. Sometimes I might eat too much. No worry about my weight, got the dad bod rocking on me. Sketches on my feet, cargo shorts look good on me. I'm a dad, that's what I do. Hey everybody, welcome back to Home Dad Chat. Uh, Danny and I figured we'd, hit, we'd finally hit record and start talking for a few minutes before we bring in our special guest for the night. Yeah, that's yeah. right, we have a guest tonight. Oh, are you so excited, Danny? <laughs> you know, I don't like share my time with you, Brock. I'm just going to be, no, no, I actually, yeah, I'm actually pretty <laughs> excited because of who we've got coming on and because of his, uh, we talked about it earlier, but how many irons he has in the fire and all the mm -hmm. things that he knows and things that he's done. And I'm really, um, having ADHD, I, I definitely love having somebody I can talk to about 50 different subjects, you know, right. and he's really an authority on some, I would call him an authority. Maybe he wouldn't, but I would call him an authority on so many things that he's done. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited. Yeah. I I, I definitely am. So, and, and too, on top of that, he is a OG stay at home dad. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yep, yep. I, I definitely want to pick his brain about like life back then and, uh, kind of how he transitioned into what he's doing now, because like, I think a lot of us have that where like, what do we do? Like when the mm -hmm. kids get older, I, I, I saw where I think it was, somebody was asking that, like, what do I do? How do I move out of this after 17, you know, after you know, mm -hmm. 17 years or whatever, if you've had like one kid, which, you know, typically if you have more than one, it's going to translate to more years, yep, but yep. what do you, how do you move into something else? How do you explain that to people? And we've talked about mm -hmm. that a little bit on the show in the past, yeah. but um, it's always kind of fun to hear other people's journeys on that. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited to pick his brain about that. Yeah. And people that have already done it, as opposed to you and I just kind of giving, you know, some conjecture to what would I probably do? Would I do that? Well, I don't know. Really, when we get there, we'll figure it out. And he's already been there and done that. So yeah, I think it'd be good to talk to him about it. Yeah. So we'll be bringing on our uh, special guest here in just a moment. And uh, we'll be back with that and, uh, and have a fun conversation with them. So one moment and we'll be right back. Become a member of the National At-Home Dad Network, an organization focused on providing advocacy, community, education, and support. Connecting with households where dad is the primary caregiver of the children. We do this through our webinar and podcast series, mental health support groups, regular online social events, as well as our annual convention. The National At-Home Dad Network is a 100% volunteer organization Without the generous support of its members and the community around it, we would not be able to continue the work that we do. Becoming a member gives you access to past convention speaker presentations, the ability to vote for board members annually, and ensures that the organization's fees and bills are in positive standing. Oh yeah, it should not go unmentioned that there is some cool swag headed your way if you decide to become a member. For only $35 a year, your membership provides you with the exclusive content only we can generate, and you'll be supporting an organization that benefits families all around the country and world. By advocating for them, offering them community, providing education and guidance, and supporting them to grow in their parenthood journey. And one last thing, if you contribute $500 or more, you will become a lifetime member. Not only will you receive everything already mentioned, but also a certificate recognizing your status and an exclusive National At Home Dad Network challenge coin with our trademark logo, Dads Don't Babysit. So what are you waiting for? Become a member today. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Tonight, we have a very special guest. We are honored to have David Stanley with us. And uh, David has been around the scene of blogging and writing and all kinds of different things. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting him at Dad 2.0 years ago and also getting to hear him speak. And uh, he also presented virtually for us this past year for Home Dad Con. And uh, I wanted to reach out. He was also, too, he just recently did a webinar with Matt Strain as well, so you can find that on the YouTube channel. But we're wanting to have him on tonight, and we're going to talk about uh, a whole 
bunch of fun stuff. Uh, mainly, David is an OG stay-at-home dad, and so we're going to pick his brain a little bit about that and just other parts mm-hmm. of his life as well. So, David, welcome to the show. Hey, I am so happy to be here, and I want to point out uh, occasionally as I sip a beverage here that this is lemonade. That's all it is. I want everybody to know that I may be the first guest in the history of this show, <laughs> except for a couple guys who you know have, are off alcohol for all sorts of all of their reasons that just drinking lemonade <laughs> all good man i i cannot yeah. say that is what's in my cup tonight <laughs> i think you're the first for lemonade i've only yeah. had water but that's uh yeah. lemonade sounds really good right now actually yeah well, it was 57 here in flint uh this afternoon and 57 after snow for the last four days um it was time to break out the lemonade that's for sure oh yeah definitely definitely no yeah there's uh as soon as the sun peaks out and starts warming things up get them daisies popping it's time for lemonade that's right <laughs> well cool i mean yeah that so sounds great you guys you are a man of many talents david <laughs> honestly like we were uh danny mentioned uh that you know you seem to have lots of irons in the fire as as it would be said um yeah. and honestly like before we get into all of the irons that you have in the fire uh, i know that one of the big things that we've talked about in the past um and you've posted um a few times is the fact that you were a stay-at-home dad before it was cool. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. My son is now 29, which is a whole interesting uh, dynamic because a lot of the guys that I am, that I associate with in the, all the different dad groups I'm in, uh, you know, whether it's here or fathering together, the dad bloggers group, a lot of the guys are not that much removed from the same, from the age that my son is now. Right. Uh, <laughs> Which is kind of weird, but my son, he's, he's single. He's not a dad. Uh, I, you know, doesn't appear to be on the horizon anytime too soon. Uh, he's got lots of stuff that he wants to do first, but uh, yeah, when Aaron was born back in 92, uh, my first wife, her name was Andy. Well, her name still is Andy. What the hell am I talking about? Not was Andy. Uh, she's terrific. We have a, a really good relationship. We figured out how to sort out our issues uh, after we split up when he was about five, I mean, no lie, the first couple of years were really sketchy. Uh, we were, you know, but uh, as he got a little bit older, eight, nine years old, uh, we, uh, we figured out what it was that we liked about each other in the first place. And without really talking about it all that much, we ended up going there to the things, you know, she's funny, she's smart, she's athletic. There's a lot of stuff that I found very attractive about her as a partner, and I still find attractive about her as a friend and actually her and her husband and my wife now Kathy and I we hang out I mean they're like they come over to the house for dinner for uh, holidays and stuff and we have a great time so uh, we managed to make that work but that's like a I guess probably a whole different set of stories um, back when <laughs> uh, back when Aaron was born she was a sales rep for Eli Lilly uh, she's a registered pharmacist and she'd been with Eli Lilly for oh I don't know seven eight years and was you know, pretty high up the ladder and she was making she was making serious coin and i was just coming off of a kind of a career as a semi-professional bicycle racer and i managed a ski shop in the winter and i was not definitely not making a lot of coin uh and it's just when you crunch the numbers it made sense based on um you know the cost of child care which is always expensive in every era you know this was 30 years ago uh so that uh, i was home almost all of the time with uh, with Aaron, which at first I didn't really understand how that was going to play out. And the more I did it, the more I knew that that was like, even though it was not necessarily the the choice I made at the time, because mm-hmm. I was starting a new career, uh, doing a lot of financial service, corporate financial service stuff. And I really liked it. You know, I was calling on hospitals and businesses and all that kind of stuff to help them with their benefit plans. And uh, so I kind of put that on the back burner and I just started staying home with Aaron more and more. And finally we just made it official. And, uh, we actually ended up coming out ahead, uh, financially and way ahead, uh, you know, emotionally for both kid. And I think for Andy and for me, absolutely. It was just, uh, it was an astonishing thing in 1992 for a dad to be the one providing care almost all the time. And uh, not to denigrate Andy as a mom, cause she was a fine mom. Um, just that I was the one that was there, just like mm-hmm. uh, like you guys are with your children today. And were you uh, up in? And this was up in Flint, Michigan. That yeah, yeah, all, in Flint. So what was what was the um, like 
perception towards people in the public when you were out doing that? Because I mean, that had yeah. to be completely yeah. on the other side of the coin for right. what most people and, are used to. Yeah. And, you know, Andy and I, before Aaron was born, we led a pretty corporate life. Uh, you know, we went to, you know, the galas that you were supposed to go to for hospitals and for all those sorts of things. I mean, I owned a tuxedo because we went out a lot and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't like we partied like crazy, but we were just, uh, you know, for the, the circles that we were traveling in and the, like the corporations that I was selling to, you were expected to be a part of that corporate community. Wow. Uh, and, you know, and Flint, uh, you know, for all the bad things that people like to say about Flint, Flint is an incredibly generous corporate community area. Uh, the Mott Foundation, Charles Mott, one of the founders, of course, of General Motors, uh, he, he started that legacy right from the get-go that businesses in Flint are good corporate citizens. It, no ifs, ands, or buts. If you want to succeed here in Flint in, in a corporation, you will participate in the culture and the, and, you know, and the community. And so the folks just were kind of like freaked out quite literally, you know, they'd see me somewhere like, well, how come you're, uh, you know, doing this and this instead of, uh, you know, I'm like, well, um, I'm staying home with my son. And yeah. Like, what do you mean you're staying home with your son? I'm like, well, you know, you change the diapers. You, you know, you cook the <laughs> meals, you, you know, you <laughs> vacuum the floors, you go to the grocery store, you make sure there's gas in the car the night before your wife is going on a three day sales trip, you know, so she doesn't run out of gas on her way to the airport. Uh, you know, all that stuff that we, you know, the, that the at home spouse does, I did. Uh, and there were no models, you know, I just said, well, essentially it was, well, if this was on the shoe was on the other foot, uh, what would she be doing for me to help further her career and to take care of the house? And so I just did all those things. Yeah. And I got to tell you, it was there was some seriously serious side eye that went on sometimes too. Of course, I'm oh, uh, sure. Well, and and too, yeah. like I mean, the movie Mr. Mom would have been out for about a decade prior yeah. to that. So oh, yeah, there that would have was... been at least an introduction to the fact. But of course, like I mean, it's a comedy, so it's it's got a little bit right. of that thrown into it, but. Still, like the idea, it, it it's one of those things where I'm sure it was still very like looked at, like you said, like sort of side eyed. Right. Let me. I'll tell you a, a, one story in particular that uh, you know when you're doing the grocery shopping, you're expected to buy everything that is necessary, including feminine hygiene products. And yep. Hey, newsflash: women have periods like every month, like clockwork. <laughs> like, if they're not yep. pregnant, yeah, every 28 days. There needs to be some feminine pr hygiene products in the house and more if you have daughters. I, we only had the one son, but at any rate, you know, I, I figured out early on that what I would do is I'd go and I said, well, what do you need? And she, cause you know, I really, I don't know much about feminine hygiene products. It's nothing right. I ever shop for. So what I got in the habit of doing was tearing off the end tab of the box. Yep. And uh, that way she got exactly what she wanted, the right size, you know, all mm -hmm. this, all the, all the stuff. And so, you would go to the grocery store and you would put them up on the counter. And if it was a female cashier, she'd like, Oh honey, are you sure that's what your wife wants? And I'm like, yeah, right here. You dumbass. <laughs> yeah, this is how I know what she yeah, wants. Right. right no kidding. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I actually planned this out. It's all yeah. good. Like, yeah. And then come I, in here I, all willy nilly. <laughs> yeah. I have college degrees. I have, you know, I had corporate clients that were, you know, like a hospital here in town that had 400 beds was one of my clients. You know, I, I understand how to organize and, you know, and get things done. And if it was a guy, it was actually worse because the women actually thought most of the time thought it was pretty cool. Oh, this is interesting. All right. Here you are with the kid. Okay. I, we we mm -hmm. get it. But the guy's like, oh, I guess who's not getting any for the next couple of days. I'm like, dude, I'm buying fucking tampons. Like, no, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, that in yeah, some of that is toilet paper for me, honestly. I mean, yeah. We, it's the same as toilet paper. I mean, I don't want to go to the counter and tell you why I'm buying toilet paper. I don't want to talk about poop. Come on. Right. So I don't want to talk about tampons either. Let's just buy the stuff and let's go. I'm not, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't mind talking about it. If you want to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Cause I mean, I know a lot about poop, unfortunately, right. <laughs> you know, and the same with periods. It's just something that's just a part of living, you know, yeah, definitely. So, Step Wait, I want to backtrack just one little bit on something that you talked about, because there's a whole subgroup of dad, stay at home dads who are cyclists that we have like throughout the national at home dad network. I'm one of them. Yeah. So you said you were a semi pro cyclist back before yeah. you were stay at home dad. So that would have right. been like in the eighties, basically. Right. Yeah. Uh, you're probably familiar with Greg LeMond. 
Yeah. Uh, only American to win the Tour de France, and he's won it three times. Uh, Greg is, I think he's two years younger than me. I think he was born in 60 or 61. I was born in 58. Okay. Uh, and so I got into cycling back in the very late 70s. Uh, there was an indoor track that was traveling around 160 meters around. I was traveling around the country, and a buddy of mine who was a longtime bike racer said, hey, you're going to love this. I was a ski racer. And so anytime you can, you know, go fast and pull G's, it's, it's good, right? It's like being in a sports car under your own power. And, right. and then I got, you know, I got okay at it. I mean, I was never going to race in Europe, but uh, I'd make a little prize money here and there. And in the winter, I was making enough money to, you know, to pay the bills and whatnot. And uh, so, yeah, back, in, I started racing, like, as we would say, full time. And I think summer 82. Okay. Uh, I graduated from college in 81. I spent a year as a ski coach up in Northern Michigan, came home, started winning a bunch of uh, races on the track. And the next year, really, I guess, 82, 83, hit it really hard and pretty much lived on the road uh, for nine months, eight, nine months out of the year with my teammates. Um, so know, were you road riding or was it? Was yeah, it, the, yeah. It was road riding. Okay. Well, I wasn't sure if it was that or if it was that track that the, how would you call it? The, is it the Velodrome. Pelodrome? Yeah, Velodrome. Velodrome. Uh, yeah. I was much better on the velodrome by a long shot. Um, you know, those bikes are, if you Google velodrome racing, you'll see the banking is oh, like yeah. 44 degrees. Uh, so if you stand at the bottom of a track and you put your arm out straight to your side, you touch the ground. So you got to go about 16, 17 Ooh. miles an hour just to stay up on the banking. Yeah, they're uh, cool. They're, they're a neat place. It's really cool. Uh, and you're going, you know, it's 250 meters around is the standard size. Uh, that, you know, the world standard, some are a little smaller, some are a little bigger, but most of them are, uh, you know, uh, 250 meters. And that's where I was the best at, but there, the, the racing for that was kind of up and down. And yeah. we didn't, at that time, we now have one of the finest facilities in the world uh, in Detroit, which is, you know, an hour down the road, the Lexus sponsors this velodrome down there uh, in, uh, in a really nice part of downtown Detroit. Uh, but you know, I'm 63 and I still like to ride the track, but I'm, you know, I, and I might be racing this summer, uh, at masters nationals, which are down in Indianapolis, oh, uh, cool. which, where, which has a great, uh, home dad, uh, center and the Indy dad city dads group is down yeah. there and stuff. But, uh, I was doing a lot of road racing too, only because that's what it was the most available you know, and criteriums, yeah. you know, so it'd be like one mile of a city circuit with like four, maybe six turns in it uh and you know we at that time we would do like a two-hour race like they'd say all right you know we're gonna race for two hours and ring the bell and then five laps yeah. extra we've or got say like 50 mile races or whatever we've, we've got a couple of rides like that here in cincinnati during the summer which are a lot of fun to go to yeah. like they shut off some neighborhood streets yep. and they have uh different courses which are a lot of fun to go check out um, and I've gone to those, which are a lot of fun. I've I had people always that are like, oh, are you going to get involved in it? I'm like, yeah, that's going to take a lot more training to be able to jump right. in on something like that for yeah. now. But <laughs> well, sometime down the road, maybe, but we'll see. There is a great, great race for years that I, I rode in every year for like eight years, nine years in a row in Cincinnati. Um, the this train station, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that renovated train station or i think it's yeah it's the uh, it's the cincinnati museum center yep. yeah yeah we that used to be the race course like you would come up that hill hang the left go across in front of the in front of the museum that long long straightaway yeah hang another left yeah that was the race oh that's and cool it was always of course they would schedule it for the end of july when it was 104 degrees and 80 <laughs> yeah, degrees yeah, humidity yeah. but you know that's bike racing too is you got to be able to handle the heat right uh, well the bike race i wanted to ask you about if you've ever been to because i was involved with it heavily when i was in college at indiana university is the <laughs> little 500 and i have yeah. one of the and i have one of the single speed bikes from the year before i left have you ever been to that race I have been to one of them, but uh, my brush with greatness with the uh, with the little 500 is a bunch of friends of mine uh, have raced in that. And one of my oldest and dearest friends in bike racing, a guy named Ken Nowakowski, Ken was the coach for many years at the velodrome in Indianapolis and at Marion College. Okay. And so they and he was also, if I remember correctly, one of the coaches a bunch of years. They brought him over from they brought him down, I guess right from indy down to Bloomington. yeah down to bloomington yeah, yep. down to bloomington and they brought kenny down to to help the teams because uh there were always a, i mean indianapolis has always been a great place for bicycle racing oh yeah in definitely the whole state and 
uh, so they wanted a really good coach. Was he involved in the movie Breaking Away at all? uh, Ken was not, but another friend of mine, a guy named Rick Denman, uh, was involved, if I remember correctly, I think he was involved in, oh no, Rick was involved, he said, he invented the camera jig for um, Quicksilver. Oh, okay. And, And a couple other of those bicycle racing movies that came out after that. But I did know one of the guys, Eddie Van Geis, who was one of the evil guys in Breaking Away. Yeah. Eddie Eddie was like a star uh, in U.S. <laughs> domestic racing. And uh, Gary, another one of those guys too, Gary Rybar, who yeah. has uh, since transitioned and is still riding bikes. If I remember, if I, well, I think he passed away a couple of years ago. But anyway, Gary was like the first trans guy I knew that was uh, riding bikes. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I don't remember. I mean, that's his dead name. I don't I really I lost contact with him. I don't know what name he uh, he had adopted after he transitioned. Sure. Yeah. And that that movie and the one that Kevin Costner uh, was in, like, those are some of my favorite, like, bike movies. I forget. That's yeah. something American Racer. American or Flyers. Or American Flyers. That's what it yep. is. Yeah. Um, so another good one. Rick, my friend, Rick Denman. Uh, now I'm going to have to tag Rick when this goes live. Because I'm <laughs> he invented the camera mounts that were used in uh, in those movies. And his company is called Bikes Camera Action. Okay. And when you watch those movies, you'll see bicycle racing footage provided by, and that's Rick Denman, who's actually from uh, Detroit originally. That's awesome. Kind of a, yeah, he was kind of a mentor to me when I first started. He is... Uh, He's now doing a really cool thing. He travels up and down the Pacific Coast Highway and all through California, where he now lives, with a huge trailer behind him, and he picks up trash. Okay. Up, I mean, tons and tons. And he inspires other people as he rides through there to join him and to take and to do like bicycle adopt a highway. Oh, mm-hmm. that's cool. I like yeah. that. Definitely. Yeah. Rick's a great guy. So you so you've gotten into cycling, you you become a stay-at-home dad. Do you do that for like the entire time of your son's like you know yeah. child life like 17 years 18 years old when he goes oh, off to no, college no, or no not much um when Aaron started when Andy and I split up I think Aaron was five or six and then it really became a juggling match because um I that's when Andy and I split up so my parents were really important as partial caregivers then because I had decided uh the last couple of years that Andy and I were together I became, I, I played soccer at Michigan State and um, Andy had a son who was, he's a little bit older than our son. He's uh, like 42 or 43 now. He just finished 15 years as a helicopter pilot in the U.S. Army as a warrant officer, go Army. Yeah. And uh, he was, he used to fly medevacs into hot zones and pick up our, our wounded and whatnot. And he was a pretty extraordinary guy himself. But um I had start. I had been coaching like AYSO and some travel league stuff, and they approached me to be the um, cycling coach. Or listen to me, I'm still ten minutes ago the soccer coach at one of the local high schools. And so now I've got to depend on my parents to help take care of Aaron because I'm coaching this team because I can't take Aaron to practice all the time. And I'm also in grad school because as a result of being this high school soccer coach, I found out I really liked high school kids, uh, and they listened <laughs> to me. I know it sounds crazy, but I would, uh, I would say things and the kids would listen and they would respond appropriately. And we had winning teams and the kids got good grades. And I thought, and my mom actually said, you know, maybe you should think about yeah. education. And I have a zoology degree and I've always been a science nerd. So I got a uh, teaching certificate here in Michigan to teach uh, a variety of high school sciences, actually middle school too. I'm certified from uh, grades seven through 12 in chemistry and physics and zoology and biology and physical science. Wow. Yeah. I think that's all of them. Okay. Well, yeah. So I was in, I was in grad school and doing the teaching certificate at the same time here at university of Michigan in Flint. And so my parents, when all that was going on, were really, really important to help take care of uh, Aaron as he was, you know, to get him to school. And, you know, he was also getting active in sports and I was dating the woman who is now my wife. And so Kath was also really important that because she was working a full-time job. Uh, She was the clinic coordinator. This is really cool. Actually, I'm kind of getting off the dad thing, but she was the clinic coordinator at the university of Michigan gender uh, reassignment surgical center. Oh, wait, how long ago was that? Uh, Let's see. I'm going to say maybe 20 years ago. Oh, okay. Um, Yeah. She was. 
Yeah, she managed the. She was the clinic coordinator for the for the University of Michigan gender uh, program for I, I want to say like eight or ten years. She's upstairs. So I don't feel like shouting up to her, but that's pretty accurate. <laughs> It's all good. And, it's close and so, yeah. And so they were doing, you know, both, they were doing some really extraordinary bottom surgery, which is really complicated stuff, as you can imagine. Yeah. And then of course, uh, you know, managing patient care for things like the psychological care that, uh, you know, that goes along with anybody who's transitioning in, in either direction. It's very difficult. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's better today. So if you can imagine how, and it's still tough. So if you can imagine what it was like in, you know, 1995, it oh, yeah. was it was madness. It really was. I mean, yeah. they were literally saving lives because if they wouldn't have taken these people in and said, "We can help you uh, with this. You're not alone. This gender dysphoria, this ident- these identification issues, they're real. You're not crazy. Please do not take your own life. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can help you manage all of this." And so that was that was her job. She has a master's in psych mental health nursing, okay. and uh, so she managed the clinic and directed traffic, so to speak, for the surgeons and for the psychologists and the psych- psychiatrists and all that. Very cool stuff. Very proud of what she was doing there. Yeah. And, and so I'm proud just hearing the story, honestly. Yeah. That's, that's well, good stuff. Well, it is. And so all of those folks, that's, you know, so that's when I was in grad school, like I said, this would have been around 99, I think, is when I started teaching or 2000 when I started teaching full time. And by then, of course, Aaron was, you know, eight, 10 years old. He was in, you know, elementary, late elementary school. And, you know, at that stage of things, 10, 12 years old, you need to, so you need to be there when they're home. But the rest of the time, you know. Right. Yep. And that's yeah. the thing. A lot of, I think a lot of times that's one of the, uh, I don't know what you call it, like questions or comments that people make all the time. Oh, your kids are all in school. Your kid's in school all day long. What are you doing? Type of thing. And, yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I think it really just varies on the family and the dad and what, you know, what is expected. I mean, I know for me, like I tend to stay busy volunteering at the school and doing things around the house and it basically being my wife's personal assistant while she's doing her thing for, for work and stuff. And I I think other dads, you get ones that have multiple kids and it's like, (laughs) what am I doing? I'm at home doing laundry and trying to clean the house so that they can come home and wreck it, you know, that kind of deal. So, well, and that's exactly right. I mean, we only, I only had the one son and he was spending part of the time at his mother's too. So uh, it was, you know, and, and she was good about, you know, getting him to tennis or getting him to soccer as well. So it was not no longer by necessity. Um, Yeah. But those uh, first four or five years that he was uh, uh, actually up to about second uh, kindergarten or second grade, you know, it really was. Yeah. Like, I mean, you guys have been there. You are the one taking care of the kid, uh, which is. uh, Danny and I are right there now. Yeah. right. (laughs) That's us right now. (laughs) Right now. Yeah. And if you have. I was just saying, I'm going pretty good though. All of my kids are in school. So there is, and it's really funny though, because the thought of, well, what are you going to do with all your time? And I don't have anybody that's a stay at home parent that even would do anything less than roll their eyes at that question. They definitely right. wouldn't ask that question because uh, the same thing I've been doing, but yeah. just, I have a little more time during the day, maybe yeah, because right. of all the stuff going, especially because the way, you know, and, and Brock's life is this way too for our family. Um, and I feel, I don't feel any pride in this, but I should, and I, I know want to feel pride in it, but it's just, it just isn't there yet, but we wouldn't be where we are if it wasn't for me. You know, if there yeah. wasn't somebody here taking care of all of these things and it continues now, because if I went to work now, one of the kids gets sick or like tomorrow we have an e-learning day and it's just because let's right. just have an e-learning day. And I mean, there's a reason there's testing this week and they wanted to have, give the kids a break. And I'm like, but how do you do it? If you have two parents right. working, you know, we're very fortunate. We've been able to make, do this. It has been a sacrifice, but, and it's, you know, the, the value that a, an at-home parent brings to the relationship and to the family is uh, it's almost, a new, you know, just, I don't think you could put a number on it really. You know, there's no I saw- dollar amount that would fit. You know. I saw a tweet actually this today from a new local news station that said, um, how would you feel if the schools cut to four days a week um, and that kind of thing? Would that help out or would that be bad? I'm like, no, I'm like, it's not going to help out because employers are not willing to cut down to four days a week. And unless every employer agrees to that, 
it's going to be complete and utter chaos. And then on top yeah. of it too, like we already have one of the craziest childcare crises in this country. So those things weigh out the whole idea of this dream world of a four day school day. It just is impossible. Yeah. yeah. Currently I, it just, it isn't viable at all. I think. Yeah. We would have to have just a massive do over uh, of the American mindset. That ain't going to happen. No, <laughs> you know, because it would have to be four days of school. It would have to be four days of work. You know, um, mm -hmm. if you're, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, uh, Don Hudson, you know, who is a terrific guy. Uh, you know, his wife is an ER doc and I don't know what their schedule is like, but I have a buddy who's an ER doc and they oh, work like I... Yeah. They work like they work three twelves, I think. They work insane mm -hmm. hours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. David David McMillan, uh, who was at Home Dad Con, we talk about him pretty much a, a lot on this show because he's a good friend of mine here in town. His wife's an ER doctor, and I know scheduling things with him. Before I even say, "Hey, do you want to go do this?" I'm like, "What is this? What is your wife's schedule schedule like? What days does she have off? Because those are the days I know that I can be like, "Hey, we can go do these things without having to worry about juggling the kids if I want this time with him." <laughs> Mm -hmm. right yeah and, yeah and and i don't think any of our employers are willing to swap to a you know four day you know no. nine ten hour and that's the crazy thing how did we decide that 40 hours a week was the optimum <laughs> time frame for getting shit right. done right <laughs> right no kidding where did that where the where the frick did that come from mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know i mean i i essentially i i work kind of in a way like two or three jobs. Um, and granted, I'm my own. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> and I'm kind of my own boss now that I'm no longer teaching. But, um, you know, I get a crap ton of stuff done in six hours. Of course, I don't have kids, you know, my mm -hmm. son, you know, and my wife is doing her thing. So, but uh, I get an awful lot done in six hours a day. And off, uh, probably in terms of like productivity that I can show you, at more than I did when I was teaching, which was, mm -hmm. you know, an eight or nine hour day. Because, you know, the, the only people who think teachers only work from bell to bell are the ones who have never been around teachers. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, I get the, yeah. I get the same thing when I was a youth minister. It was like, oh, you only work when you're at the church. I'm like, oh, you're so funny. Yeah. Like, especially yeah. like, oh, you're a part time, you're a part time minister, a part time pastor. Like <laughs> that title does not fit. <laughs> right. <laughs> So that just means I actually do other stuff too. That's all that means. It doesn't right. mean it's like, oh, it's only an hour a day. Right. right. Well, I, I mean, we had a pat, we had a professor at our school who taught preaching. And I remember him vividly telling us like he lived across the parking lot from the church that he preached at. And the people at the church would be like, oh, you're only here one day a week. And they're like, why do you think that? And it's like, <laughs> oh, because we only see your car in the parking lot by the door on Sundays. The rest of the time, it's at your house. And he's like, that's because I walk across the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, he started having to park his car right at the, by the door of the church. And then like, he's walking from the church to the house like he's normally is. But it's like, now it looks like he's there all the time. Yeah, I'm just going <laughs> to leave my car here. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's kind of yeah. like your kids. Your kids, I don't know about for you guys, but my kids don't think I even exist from the time they leave to right. the time they get home. I don't, I'm just like in stasis. Yeah. You know, I just, there's, I don't do anything. I just wait for them to come home. And I'm like, no way. Cause one of them asked me this, well, wait, what do you do when we leave? And I'm like, well, okay. Who cooks, who cleans, who does the laundry? And then I go to the Y and I, I mean, I've got a million things that I do. You need, to set, a like, go, you need to set a GoPro up so. in, in a place where you can like capture it all. in one day. <laughs> that would be, I like that <laughs> idea. <laughs> Show it all. I like that idea. It's it's just, like, show me, like, here, you like watching YouTube? Watch this. <laughs> yeah. This is me all day. And well, like when you get, you get an opportunity with one of your kids to have them with you and they're not sick, you know, and so that you could yeah. take them through your day. And every time my kids have dragged by 11 oh, yeah. o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, they're I was done. Like, Dad, yeah. I mean, can we stop? And I'm like, no, I gotta go. I got a million things to do before <laughs> everyone yeah. comes home and the other million things yeah. show up. You know? See this list? Yeah. All yeah. of these things have to be <laughs> done. <laughs> right. Right. No right. kidding. And we were here's talking you, earlier. Here's what you call the live stream, Danny Cam. <laughs> 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 oh it's my like, gosh and it's like with laundry we were talking about that earlier and yeah. my second wife actually told this said this to me a long time ago she said you have to understand laundry is a journey 
not a mm. destination. Well, that's the truth. You don't get finished with laundry. And I went, that, that I don't like that at all. And she's like, well, yeah, you don't like it because it's true. Yeah. And that's like today, you know, I think Brock, you spent like the last, the last what, 37 hours doing laundry, I think. I've been doing laundry all day. Like? Yeah. From yeah. the moment that I dropped the kids off, came home and had breakfast after that, boom, I was, I've been doing laundry, folding it, washing yeah. it, hanging it up. I've, actually was putting laundry away before I jumped on the mic tonight. So <laughs> it's, and there's still another basket out there waiting for me to be waiting folded. for you. So, yep. <laughs> you know, yep. it's, it's the, yep. as, as it was stated in the old uh, podcast, the dad pod, uh, which was a stay at home podcast uh, a while ago. Um, it, it, laundry is the uh, unbeatable boss because yeah, we all wear laundry so even though we're like yeah i'm done it's like crap i've got clothes on that's yeah, gonna come off yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but he's dirty already <laughs> when like, aaron was about oh I was, I was gonna say when aaron was like 12 or 13 he he um was juggling soccer and tennis he ended up being like a full-time he played tennis in college and so he became you know around eighth grade a full-time tennis player but like i think it was about seventh grade he was juggling soccer and he was juggling tennis and he was juggling school because he's he got good grades because he was stubborn and smart. And that's a you know that's a recipe for disaster in a, a pre teenager. <laughs> and uh, he didn't have the right socks, I think it was, or shorts for one sport or the other. And he started pissing and moaning. And Kath and I looked at each other and like, come here, Junior. Let's introduce you to Mr. Washer and yeah. Mr. Dryer. <laughs> and from that time on, you know, when he was like, I think he was in eighth grade. He was responsible for all his own laundry. Mm -hmm. And that way we never had to hear a complaint again about, well, you know, I wear these socks for tennis. I like these <laughs> other ones. I'm like, eh, not my problem, man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Fix it. There's your answer. Yeah, right, you don't right. have to rely on me anymore. That's no That's problem. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I tell you, the sooner that you can make your kids self-sufficient, just the better it is all around, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because then they're well, ready also for the real world as well. It, oh, bingo. Too. And I find that it always helps them that they know this is what they're responsible for. And they, they just have a certain depth of understanding that you can't get any other way, that this is a hard thing that I have to do every day. I mean, even like my kids are love to read, right. Read all the time, but they're required to read by the, by the school and by their teachers, you know, they write it and they log it in. It's 20 minutes and all that. And I'm like, this isn't a hardship on you. Just sit down and read. And they're like, I don't want this. So I'm like, no, 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 no. This is one of those daily grind things that you're going to do for the rest of your life. Maybe yeah. not reading, but you know, whatever it's going to be, this is a daily thing that you're just going to have to do, right? Suck it up and finish it. And then it's 20 right. minutes, man. You can right. read for 20 minutes without blinking. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So. This is right. This is not, this is not complicated. This, yeah, stuff this is not that big a deal. Yeah. That's I can't, right. I can't keep books out of my kid's hands. So I, I don't feel uh -huh. your pain in that at all, Danny, because my kid yeah. is the other way. It's like, I have to try to rip the book out of his hands. And at <laughs> night I'm like, it's night, go to sleep. And he's like, but I got to finish this chapter. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh yeah. my gosh, you can find out how the Viking or the dragon kills X, Y, Z thing like right. the next day. Yeah. My <laughs> kids only have a problem with it because it's required. Right. That's just because there's a list saying you have to do this. Otherwise, they're like, yeah. You know, well, what's really funny too is they read books that are too much above their level. They still understand them. They have a good, you know, uh, mental acuity. I will say, I get that from my wife, having the ability to read books that are a little bit further along. So, what happens, unfortunately, is our teachers are like, oh, well, you're supposed to read this many books a month. And this is how we know. And your son hasn't read, hasn't even read one book. And I'm like, well, but he's reading this. It's it's actually Brock. I think we talked about it previous about the immune book. Oh it's, yes, uh, but, yeah. I mean, it's amazing, and it's and I'm like, but this is thick science stuff that he's reading, right. and he's not going to finish that in a week, a month. You know, he'll definitely do it in six months or a year, but he can't give you a a, a book report every week unless you want a chapter to chapter report, right? Yeah. Right. My son's nine, and he's reading a brief history of time. Cut him some freaking slack, <laughs> nice. <you> lady. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> Well, the yeah. book that Danny's talking about specifically, the guy who wrote that book, uh, he has all these awesome like science videos on YouTube that my kids Who love. Like, the, the, uh, I'd, I'd have to look for it on us. I'll okay. tell, well, we'll have to tell you afterwards. I'm uh, just curious because I used to recommend Veritasium. Okay. And, and oh, there was one other guy that was really good, too. And I'm drawing a blank. Honestly, this, I mean, this guy jumps is, into everything yeah. from like deep sea to deep space to are mm -hmm. there aliens? I mean, he gets into all kinds of, but he wrote this book on uh, like I biology. Hear, I hear a kid. That Yeah, that's his kid. <laughs> but <laughs> it's all good. But anyway, yeah. So, I mean, 
we he introduced me to, he introduced me to it and then i pulled it up on youtube and like my kids will actually request it as like that's what they want to watch on youtube and that's awesome they're all these fun little like maybe 15 minute videos and they're very colorful um and articulate and my kids love documentaries anyways and so this is like mini documentaries the whole way through did you find it yeah i, yeah, I had to look it up because I, I knew you were i, I saw knew, you like because i, I can't remember this it's philip it. detmer philip detmer is the name of the author and he wrote immune which is the I've book that, that my name. son is reading but yeah. the the founder of and this again kurzgesagt kurzgesagt s-a-g-t like, yeah it's like german or i don't know something. yeah one of the largest channels on YouTube, though, and it is just, I mean, and David, you said you're, you know, a science nerd. I am absolutely, oh, yeah. my kids all just love it. And we can sit around and watch. And the, the thing about YouTube, again, you know, you can spend too much time. You can find things that are bad for you, basically, but it's a tool yeah, like any yeah. other tool. And it's how you use it. And we do stuff like this. And my kids are sitting there like he's talking to a science teacher last year about building a Dyson sphere. Right? Get out. <laughs> yeah, right. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> where the hell I didn't did even, get that? I didn't even know at the time what a Dyson sphere was. And I'm a fairly prolific reader and I'm a pretty big geek, but he got it from the Avengers movie. And I think, oh, Rock yeah, 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 that's in where, there. Yeah. yeah, where Thor is standing, basically holding open the, the, the portal Dyson to sphere, a Dyson right? sphere and he's getting yeah, all the, the that, power man. of the star. And my son was like, Dad, that's what I want to do when I, I'm, I'm going to go to MIT. And then I'm going to be an astronaut somehow. And then I'm going to go to space and build a Dyson sphere around the, our sun. And it's just okay. it. And that's it. And he's, there's no, you know, I might do this. I don't know if I could. It's just, no, this is what I'm going to do when I grow up. And I'm like, man, that's I don't awesome. know kid you are, but man, <laughs> go for it. Very you know? cool. But it's yeah. because of channels like that was the point. It's because of channels yeah. like Kurzgesagt. I butcher that name forever. But Philip Detmer being so making science and making facts and making learning yeah. so inviting, you know, just yeah. to, just to bring it to you and say, well, this is why you should be excited about Dyson spheres. It's very you know, down to earth science do. teaching too, which yeah. is awesome part. It's not over your head. And you're like, Oh, like, okay, this makes sense. Like he just, it's so um, elementary. I mean, mm -hmm. for, for a six-year-old and a nine-year-old to sit down and be like, I want to watch this and like, just take it all in right. is, is yeah. amazing to me. And one of the one of the cool things, bringing it back to the at home dad thing, especially if you're a homeschooling at home dad, mm -hmm. um, if you can figure out a way to make science real and ep applied for your kids, they will fall in love with it forever, which is one of the things I did with my high school science kids, because a lot of we've all had science teachers that just you know, yes, they knew their stuff and they could manipulate the numbers and they could make everything work out in the end, but there was no spark there that anything that they were doing was, was interesting. It was just, you know, and I've had some math teachers like that too, where you're like, wow, this is like, oh, hi, we're talking about some science stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's and, getting interrupted tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you can, <laughs> and if you can get the kid intrigued in it you got mm -hmm. lifelong learners and the best way to do it is in the kitchen yes uh, yeah over yeah. years and years of teaching high school sciences of if you can't figure out a way to make what's going on in the kitchen of the house which is the coolest room in the house Absolutely. Uh, apply to whatever science you're teaching whether it's zoology or chemistry or physics or whatever you're doing it wrong that's yeah. all there is to it you're doing it wrong because what is cooking but it's applied physics applied chemistry you know i mm -hmm. mean and, and mathematics too yeah, yeah. exactly the of, right you know the, the number of times that i remember telling them i need a quarter cup and they just think of that as a word like this is a description of a thing i'm like no no i no, think it is one quarter of a cup it's a full cup so it's one fourth of that and you just see like the light bulb comes on and their brain yeah. just explodes You're like like four quarters in a dollar dad and i'm like yeah there ding, you go ding, ding, it's, ding, ding. it's yeah. all around you good job here's fractions you know <laughs> that's right a light bulb have pops a, on it does yeah. yeah have a brownie yeah right, exactly yeah. let's that's make good. some cookies yeah. but but even now my kids are no they know like uh what is it uh baking soda and vinegar right oh, yeah. um, to make the volcanoes and we yeah. we have not made a volcano but there are a lot of things that are cleaning uh suggestions or recipes that that we'll listen to or talk you know hear about and they'll be like wait 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 they want you to put baking soda and vinegar down your sink 
dad. <laughs> yeah. These guys are trolling you. That's not yeah. going to do what you, that's going to just explode, <laughs> dad. Come on. I'm like, no, you got to look at how they're doing it and the amounts. We're not going to just dump it in there until it blows up. You know? Yeah, right. No but, they, but they know that only because, again, like you said, we've looked at it in the kitchen. We've spent yeah. time together looking, dynamically learning what these things mean, which is to, a huge uh, part. I have to take a break here for a half a second because I thought I had a full charge on my laptop and I just, my screen started to go dim and it's telling me, and my charger's right here. So I just got to plug it in. I don't know if you edit this out or not. I do. But, uh, I do. Yeah. You're okay. Good. We're well, leaving this in do. though. We're leaving <laughs> oh, this in. <laughs> <laughs> Staying in. I don't care, man. <laughs> We're going to tell the true story of what happened while interviewing How David. It really Stanley. was. <laughs> do you want to stop the recording and, and nah, come it's back okay. home? I can cut it back. It's fine. I mean, my wife's already walked in on the podcast and she's going to, she's going to, she's going to get it here in a minute. So, I mean, I, I literally, I tell all of them, no, I'm, I'm doing a podcast and they all know it. And I've gotten no lie. I've gotten four text messages. Like, I mean, oh my I've got God. four text messages from my 15 year old <laughs> wanting me to go get him, take him to get Taco Bell. I'm like, <laughs> No, I'm not gonna. I mean, okay, I do kind of want to talk about, but right? I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> Is it like it's, a commercial? You hear the bong, and you're right? like, I'm yeah. <laughs> and it's Taco Bell. You can't go wrong with that. But we've already had dinner. I made sure you ate. Oh, wait, it's Taco right? Tuesday. I thought alone. you already had tacos. Yeah, yeah. We, did. And he's, we had tacos. Check my Instagram. I posted yeah. the picture already. There you go. There you go. Got to get one. Oh my stuff. goodness. Yeah, but then my my seven year old comes in asking for, and it's funny because I keep snack baggies in the the pantry. And like their school snack shelf is all right here. So they make their own, you know, like, here's your snacks, get what you want. You know, the, if it's goldfish or, you know, whatever, and there's carrots in there and all that stuff. So uh, she comes in with a snack bag and she's like, Dad, can I have some cookies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can have some cookies in the back of my hand. No, <laughs> wouldn't well, do that. But all right. Well, we're going to anyway. get back on track a little bit here. So, um, I, so here's what I'm curious about. You have really just sort of gone after everything when it comes to like writing and, you know, with, with your sonnets, which I've gotten to hear a couple of them in person and they're beautiful. Um, I think the one that I got to hear, the last one I got to hear was, I believe it was about your dad. And I had followed the story of, of your dad because um, you had been posting it online right. a little bit as well. Yep. Um, but then you came and actually like read a sonnet, which put us all in tears in the room there at dad too. One of my um, proudest moments, quite frankly. <laughs> you had us all in tears, man. <laughs> uh, including myself. I mean, my dad yeah. had only died like two weeks earlier. Right. And so that was really, that was really raw stuff. And it was, uh, it, it was, it, it was a life-changing moment for me. I mean, I say that I kind of smile on my face now because I can celebrate my dad, you know, three years later with his, because he had such a great life. But uh, to, to know that something that you write has that yeah. kind of effect on somebody. A room. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were four people in that room in a room full crying. of people that like supported you, though. Like, they, oh, you was, know, yeah. you knew that, too. That's yeah, the great it part. Incredible. It was just and it literally life changing because all of a sudden I realized, hmm, this sonnet stuff. People are interested <laughs> in what I have to say about the world mm -hmm. when I do it in this very particular form. Yeah. And they still are. I mean, it's I've I'm like 175 sonnets in over the last couple of years since you yeah. and I first met down in. Uh, in san antonio yeah yeah oh. so that's so that's one thing that i've been intrigued just by like following you and, and, and listening to that now the other thing is, is that you've got some books that you've written now mm -hmm. one i could not find i swear you wrote this book and maybe i'm just imagining this. did you write okay. a book that involves something with like jim crow or yeah yeah it's called from jim crow to ceo the willie artist story it is available on amazon okay um, I, it wasn't popping up for me and that's why i was like where is that i know he wrote that yeah, yeah i did uh, in fact, uh, I'm having lunch with Willie on uh, Thursday. He's oh, cool. uh, still alive and kicking. Nice. Uh, he's he's hanging in. He's in kidney failure, as a lot of 86 year old men are. Mm -hmm. Women too, of course. But uh, Willie was born in 35 in Memphis in the Jim Crow South. Wow. And mm. ended up through a, you know, as people do, first in Chicago where he fell in love with the blues, uh, and got to see all of the great blues players like. Uh, you know, Muddy Waters and, El oh, wow. uh, you know, uh, Buddy Guy and Albert King. In fact, growing up, he, his older brother was B.B. King's piano player. Ooh. Oh, wow. All yeah, right. That's, that's what, what the, I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. Talk about brush with fame. Man. Uh, that's, kidding. Wow. Yeah. And, and Willie was like 14. And you know how rock and rollers have always liked to party. 
and BB had this big pink Cadillac and this was back in the forties. Well, he didn't have a driver's license yet. He wasn't even 16 yet. And his brother would take him on the, on the, would have him drive to their gigs during the week because he, they wouldn't let him drink and they would all be partying. There'd be girls in the backseat, you know, doing the thing that rock and roll stars do. And, you know, Willie artists don't turn your ass around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the uh, awesome. And Willie became, uh, he got involved in the packaging business, which if you know anything at all about industry, uh, major corporations don't box up and ship out uh, their own stuff. They don't handle that because that's not what they do. That's not their expertise. And Willie became quite expert in the packaging industry, uh, worked his way up from making boxes literally on the floor uh, to owning the second largest uh, packaging company or the second largest corporation in the city of Flint after General Motors, uh, the largest minority owned business doing business with General Motors in the United States. He wow. became extremely wealthy, but more importantly, he gave away, a, he's giving away a, just a shit ton of money. To, he's funding scholarships and foundations and, you know, cause he's got a great, he recognizes that he had a great life and a lot of things went right for him. So he's, he's paying it back. And uh, he was on Obama's minority business council. And I mean, cool. literally picked, yeah, there's pictures all over his home. I've been lucky enough to be to his house a bunch of times. I only live like a half hour from him. And uh, there's a picture of president Obama with his arm around Veronica, his wife, who is a lovely woman. So kudos for Barack to choosing to put his <laughs> arm around Veronica. <laughs> good no, choice. No, good choice. Yeah, right. And there, he was there. If you ever saw the Christmas at um, the White House thing where Smokey Robinson and all those great Motown stars yeah, were there. Yeah, yeah. Well, Willie is the tall black uh, man sitting in the second row who, when he stands up, people are doing this behind him because he's, <laughs> and he's couldn't blocking see around. everybody's view. Yeah, yeah, because they were all standing up, but Willie's a big guy and nobody could see around him. So, so that book is that is that basically a memoir or bio, yeah. a biography of his life? Then, right? Willie put together uh, about a thirty thousand word uh, manuscript of things that kind of like quickly came to his mind, mm. and through a mutual friend who had read my melanoma book, that was the first book I wrote. Um, they put us in touch, and Willie and I hit it off like right from the get go because I bought him coffee at a local coffee shop, and this guy, you know, I mean, this. <laughs> Right? Just out of the blue, like, hey, man, I got your coffee. Well, we set up the meeting and I said, here, let me go get your coffee for you. And I bought okay. his coffee. And, uh, you know, he's worth millions and millions and I'm worth thousands and thousands. Right. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I popped for the coffee. And, uh, <laughs> and so from there on out, we sat down uh, once a month for about a year and a half, um, sometimes more than that, because that doesn't take into account all our phone conversations and whatever. But we sat down for at least it'd be like a two, three hour meeting uh, once a month. And then a couple of times, like I said, on the phone and Willie would tell me stories and he has a phenomenal memory and his memory is chronological. So it was easy. It was relatively easy for me to make sure all the things were in the right order as they occurred. And uh, I'll give you, a, for instance, the, Willie was 13 when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball. Wow. Right? 1947, he was born 35. He was 12 or 13. Willie mm. came up with like two paragraphs in his memoir of what that meant. <laughs> it's a whole chapter by the time I got done with it. Because, <laughs> you know, I kind of grew up, I grew up in the North End of Flint with a lot of African American friends. And I knew from talking to their dads how big a deal it was when Jackie did this. He was, yeah. the, he was, he was their guy. You know, everybody became a Dodgers fan. Right. Uh, when Jackie, every black man in America was a Dodger fan. There's, mm -hmm. I, I will say that without any question. Even if you were a Willie Mays fan and you worshiped the Giants, you were a Jackie fan because he did it first. And so to hear some of uh, like the stories of pe preachers in Memphis preaching on Sunday about Jackie and something that happened in a game a couple days before in the way, you know, related to a Bible theme of what Jackie yeah. was doing. Uh, yep. yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was. Probably a lot of David and Goliath. <laughs> well, and a lot of turn the other cheek and a yeah. lot of, you know, be strong, uh, but you don't have to, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because, you know, Jackie was told by Branch Rickey, the guy who signed him, I need somebody who's strong enough not to fight back because you can't yeah. win this battle. 
That's what yeah. I loved about the movie uh, 1942 or, or number or was it 42? 42. 42. 42. It was yeah, 42. that was 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 a was a great movie. So yeah, like that's there's a lot of good stuff in there for sure. Please buy that book, and I don't make very much money off of it because uh, we it's uh, you know it's a Kindle, uh, but the story I likened it on another uh, podcast that I did to the stories that we have of the Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. And I'm a Jew, so I, I can I can kind of liken those two to each other because those people, there's not many of them left. And when you have the opportunity to hear the words of somebody who survived the, the death camps and made it out of the camps and told their story and is letting the world know, even when they're 95, 100 years old, you got to listen to them. And those same people who were born, you know, in Jim Crow when their great grandparents or maybe their grandparents, I'd have to go back and check the timeline were slaves. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. I know great grandparents. I'm not sure if his grandparents were or not. Uh, if you, we have to keep those stories alive and yeah. Willie, Willie remembered so many of those stories of like cops dragging his brother down the street, handcuffed and ankle break and ankle, you know, bracelets mm -hmm. and whatever mm -hmm. and dragging him up the steps boom 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 throwing mm -hmm. him in the living room standing on him in his parents living room and saying we caught him trying to break into an ice cream shop down the street which was a complete and total lie it yeah. was just cops who wanted to beat the crap out of some black kid in memphis in you know 1944 Jeez. You know, we yeah. have to we what's have to even crazier closer. is that kind of thing is still going on to this day yeah yeah it is yeah so am it's on amazon and uh they i'm gonna have to get it man because it sounds really good and yeah. i like i said I've, I've heard you speak a little bit about it but um it's i like history books and uh um, it's history it, it's definitely something that i'm gonna have to to yeah, grab up really and we'll good. make sure to put a link in the uh yeah. in the description too for others to be able to purchase it as well along with that everybody gets to get a chance to if, if, if they've <laughs> depending on what books they listen to you've done like over like 30 audio books yeah i think i'm at 40 actually i think i'm at 41 now 41 I've, I've i've narrated 41 audio books <laughs> that's awesome uh, yeah uh i'm involved with a, a company right now um they actually it's the company that actually uh published my melanoma memoir called melanoma it started with the freckle and mm -hmm. uh if you've ever had any kind of chronic disease or any kind of tr near tragedy in your life like that the, it doesn't matter what it was, you know, if you had uh, skin cancer, like uh, metastatic melanoma is a form of skin cancer. If you had, you know, brain tumors, if you had pulmonary embolisms, which I also had, uh, you know, if you have horror, you know, if you've had colon cancer, any of those things were the fear of dying, you know, ahead of schedule, so to speak. Uh, yeah. That's really what the book is about. I mean, yes, it's about a lot about melanoma, but it's really about all the terror and all the anxiety and all the life affirmation stuff that comes along with it too. And it's called Melanoma. It started with the freckle. And the company that published that book, they liked my audiobook narration of it. And so now I do all of their uh, narrations for them. And we're doing a series of great books. So we, if you're a Stoic and you like Epictetus, or the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, uh, where it's called um, books. What's the big idea? Books that matter. And so we're doing nice. new, we're doing new new translations and new explications of these old old classics. Uh, we've done several. We've done uh, Credo. We've done a couple different Plato books. Uh, so and also they um, do some fun stuff too. They do. He's big into bicycle racing as I am. Yeah. Uh, and so I do all of his uh, audiobook narrations for all of the bicycle books that that he has published as well. So it's it's really a cool relationship that we have with him. That's really neat. I actually a buddy of mine uh, from the Bible study that I'm in dropped off a book to me because I've been restoring a motorcycle. Nice. And he was like, "Have you ever heard of the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle <laughs> Maintenance?" <laughs> And I'm like, no, I haven't, but it sounds very oh. intriguing. And so he was like, I have a copy. He's like, I got it at half price, half price books. He's like, I'll bring it over to you and you can read through it. And I'm like, I've only gotten in maybe like about a chapter of it. And I'm just like, this is very interesting. I think I'm going to enjoy mm -hmm. it. It was written in the early, late sixties. It was published in the early seventies. Mm -hmm. uh, I read it so many times when I was like a 
senior in high school and then freshman, sophomore year in college, the cover literally came off and I'm on my second copy of it. <laughs> Wait till you get to the section. And I, I'm not really giving anything away here because he has a friend who has this BMW, very snazzy bike for that time. And he's yeah. very down to earth. Uh, he's a very down to earth guy, Robert Persick. Uh, and he, um, the guy's handlebars are slipping on the BMW. And he says, well, I can fix that. He says, you just need a little shim stock in there. He said, give me that uh, can of Coke and we'll snip up. He's like, what are you talking about? He says, oh, no, pop cans are perfect shim stock. They're mm -hmm. soft enough that the, the little neurals will grab onto it. Right. He said, it'll be perfect. He says, oh, no, no, I got to take it over to the BMW dealer. And he's like, so you can spend a hundred bucks for a BMW mm -hmm. certified shim stock? So I can fix it for you yeah. right now. <laughs> or no, do the no, same no, thing. I'm not going to do it. that. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to charge you a hundred dollars for a Coke can. <laughs> right. And I, I remember reading that. I'm going, that's absolutely perfect. It, you know, that is like exactly the issue. Yeah. You know? well, people, yeah, people are like, oh, I got to go take it here. It's like, no, you can fix it yourself. It's not that hard. So, but yeah. Well, man, I, we, I feel like we could talk forever, David, honestly. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty good at well, that, we, three of us. We might I have to say, I think we could, in fact, to just keep going until our families are like, what are you doing? It's we, Yeah. We probably could, yeah. Except for I'd get, I'd start having people start blowing up my phone for uh, the dad lounge, being like, "Is that going to open anytime soon?" Cause I do the dad because I, I do the oh, dad that's lounge tonight, on, isn't it? I do yeah. that on Monday and Tuesday nights. Yeah, so yeah, forget about that. But yeah, but no, I mean, you're in so many places. Like, I, it's going to be real fun putting in the description uh, or in the description box, like all the different ways that you're doing things because you're involved with like father fathering together where you're like yep. an advisor basically right I'm a board member yeah. a board member yeah i am yeah, i'm one of the original board members chris lewis christopher lewis and yeah. uh he came to me and said you know this this dad's with daughters thing's blowing up uh we yeah could use a little we could use a little help with that and i'm like well what do you want me to do he says well you know you've been around for a long time I'm like all right i'll do it next thing i know they put together this thing called fathering together with uh with brian anderson as the mm -hmm. chief operating officer and yeah Brian was at home like, dad con too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I so, like Brian a lot. Brian's a really nice guy. He's dryly hilarious. He is. Uh, he, it's, it's amazing too. Cause you don't expect it when you're talking to him, then he'll just hit you with the zinger and you're sitting there like, yeah. am I, can I laugh? We're on an official <laughs> call. Am I allowed to bust out laughing? Yeah. Right. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of, and they said, well, we'd like you on the board. I'm like, okay. And it's a very interesting board because we have a guy from, uh, uh oman on there we have a fellow mm -hmm. from uh night from kenya who lives in london now uh we've got a couple women that are involved in there because you know it's fathering together it's not yeah. just the father's fathering together but it's families mm -hmm. fathering together so we really wanted to um you know make sure that we had representation from uh and we don't have a non-binary member um at the moment uh, we don't have a uh gay or lesbian member but uh when we sent out the word for that, we were looking for some new board members. They, that we didn't see them come through in the search, but uh, just mm -hmm. as an official aside, next time fathering together is looking for board members. Please, we those are voices we want to hear. Yeah, I'm uh, sure that you'll. I'm sure that eventually you'll be getting them. Like you guys seem to be doing a lot. So we're trying. We're trying. Um, it's uh, we have some. We now have chapters in Malawi and the Philippines and oh, wow. Nigeria. Yeah. They came to us. They found us online. The miracle yeah. of social media, and they wanted support yep. in these very patriarchal countries for being hands-on dads, like we are with the Home Dad Network. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that's all of us are trying to support each other. You know, it's that rising tide lifts all boats. Things definitely, yes. and and so none of us are in competition with the other for uh, for dollars or for numbers or for mm -hmm. butts and seats. Well, I think at the end of the day all of us who are working in this fathering space are yeah. just interested in dads and people who provide quote unquote, typical dad kinds of things, right? Because yep. uh, dad is kind of a gendered sort of thing. And there are plenty of people out there that provide that sort of, well, speaking sort of, of butts and seats, I honestly, I'm hoping that we get to see your butt in a seat in Phoenix for home dad con <sighs> this year. Um, you know, my wife really likes Phoenix. And um, that that might just happen because uh, I'm comfortable flying. I think now uh, I don't think we're out of. I mean, we're not out of the pandemic yet, 
but uh, the numbers are certainly trending in the right direction. Yeah. And yeah. hopefully by Phoenix. And and Kath said that if I am interested in going to Phoenix, I am interested in her coming along. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I'd love so, to meet her. I'd love to meet her. You talk about her all the time. So it'd be great yeah. to meet her. And she's she's fun. She's just she's just a I don't want to say she's a joy to be around because that like there's this you know that <laughs> that word is loaded, isn't it? Wives it really can be is. a joy yeah. to be yeah. around, but not yeah. all the time. I get it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But she's she's very good at poking holes in, in my balloon. And trust me, I, I need a lot of that because I'm involved in a lot of different stuff. And I, I can't really lie. Most of it is reasonably successful. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, people respond positively to it because I'm not full of shit. I, I think that's like 90 percent of it is just telling the truth and yeah. being able to laugh at yourself. But sometimes you get a little full of yourself when that happens. And Kath is really good at like going, you know, you're going to get all that. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I've seen you in the morning. Right. Where that is, like, yeah, right. that, is, that, that is definitely one area where wives are, or spouses in general, are the perfect uh, partner for you when they keep you keep you in check, keep you grounded. Yep. <laughs> Best yeah. balance. Yep. When you were having that nightmare three weeks ago and you were screaming about the frogs crawling all over you, I listened. <laughs> yep. <laughs> True story. Yep. <laughs> and I sat down on the edge of the bed and I calmed you down and I, you know, <sighs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely don't don't get too big for your britches. Right now. Mm -mm. Well, I, I honestly like we're going to have you back on again, because like I said, I think we can continue to talk about all kinds of stuff and and just share stories and just yeah. have a good time. Like and that's that's the thing that I love about this. This podcast is it's very informal and we do that a lot. <laughs> I do have a really good uh, mommy, the mommy mafia story that I didn't even get to. Uh, when I was, Ooh. when Aaron was, do we have time? Can yeah, let's do quick? it. Yeah, let's All tell right. it. And then maybe we can, you know, cut some other stuff out. So anyway, Aaron was like three and we spent the whole winter playing tennis in the basement with a racquetball racket because he saw some tennis on TV and he thought this was like the coolest thing that he had ever seen. And so I got a racquetball racket out for him and a, and a racquetball and I would bounce the racquetball against the wall and he would smack it with the racquetball. And at first I would kind of like guide his hand so we would make contact, but he is you know far better at racket sports than I ever was. And he figured it out right away. So here we are. I, I'm, I'm an at-home dad. It's like 99 degrees out. We're at the tennis club, swimming tennis club up the street. And Aaron and I are sitting at the little kiddie pool. And he's like, I want to go hit. And I'm like, it's freaking noon. And, <laughs> you know, and we're, we're sunscreened up. And we got hats on. I mean, it's all. And he's like, nope, nope, got to go hit. And so he drags me out on the tennis court and we used to play crosswise with the center service line as the net. So you just have like a line there and two boxes. So it works better for little kids. And so I'm out there and we're hitting the ball back and forth. And he's just giggling because he had just figured out how to move me around. Like if I hit it like this, dad's got to run over there. Oh yeah. There, right? so, <laughs> so he's yeah. And um, so, and a couple of the moms are standing in the shade under there and they're like, wow, look at that little kid. He's really good. But then a couple of the other mean girls, the, um, <laughs> you know, the, the queen bees, as they yep, call them, yep. they, who is, I can't believe that man has that is out there with his son hitting tennis ball. Where is that child's mother? And they're like going on and on. And the other two moms who are saying, oh, it's pretty good. They're like cowed, you know, by these mean of girls. Course. Yeah. yeah. And they're just like, I'm like, and finally, after listening to this for like five minutes, I walked over, I said, it was his idea. We got water. We got hats. We got sunscreen. He dragged me out here and it's okay because we're not going to be out here all that much longer. In about 10 minutes, we're going to be in the pool. If y'all want to come watch me, you know, with my son in the pool, if you're that interested in keeping tabs with me after that, we're going to stop at Kroger on the way home to pick up the groceries. But thanks. I know how to take care of my child. Uh -huh. And they just went, <laughs> which was the nicest way I could think of in the presence of all these children who are running around here to not just go totally ballistic at these just incredible bitchy women. You know, <laughs> yep. I was, you know, I was stepping on their toes clearly. Yeah. And, and there's a know. huge, there's a huge thing. And I think we've all heard of like the mommy wars and things like that. There's a Terrible. huge yeah. difference between how dads treat each other and talk about their parenting and how moms do it. It seems to me that it's always like the moms are just trying to, you know, they're like crabs trying to escape a pot of yeah. boiling water. One's going on. No, no, you're staying here and you're staying here and us and suffering, you know, kind of thing. And dads are kind of like, oh, cool. How do you do that? Oh, right. well, can I do it that way? Well, yeah. you know, let me, how can I help you? Or, hey, can you help me figure this yeah. out? It's much more uh, give and take and acceptance of, okay, 
you gave your kid brandy to on a plane so that they'd sleep the whole trip. Okay. You know, I'm not going to judge you. I don't know that I would do that, but okay. You know, your kid better than I do. And that amount of, of, uh, surprisingly non arrogant, uh, uh, men that are out there just trying to raise their kids and fine. If you raise your kids a little bit different, you know, right. a I huge think, difference. I think a lot of it, I, I drew this analogy, uh, a few years back. Um, have you, I'm sure you've noticed that African-American folks, uh, and I've noticed it with with men always greet each other, even if they don't necessarily know each other. If mm -hmm. they're in the grocery store, there's a nod. There's, a, you know, hey, I see you. You know, mm -hmm. I, I I get I I get where we are, and I think dads are kind of like that as well. Oh yeah, when definitely. We see I'm like that another, in the grocery store. Yeah, when we see another dad with uh, with the kids, we're always like, hey, dad, looks good. How you doing? You know, and, and it, it it's not like. I'm not trying to interject into your space. I'm not trying to mm -hmm. help you be better. I'm not trying to put you down. I just want to recognize that I see you. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and, and we, and, and I don't want to draw the analogy that says, you know, what African-Americans have gone through at the hands of white people are the same as what dads have gone through at the hands of moms. Cause that ain't the oh, truth. God, no. yeah. But no. it's a similar kind of behavior where you just want to recognize somebody else for who they are and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. It's seeing your. It's kind of like seeing your tribe. Like, hey, there's another dad with their kid. I like and, that. And being yeah. able to being able to connect that way. Because, yeah, there's been a lot of times where it's like I've seen dads, and you're just like, hey, what's up, man? Like, I get it. Yeah, you're doing a good yeah. job. I, a lot yeah. of times I'm in there. Like, if I'm in the grocery store, like during the day by myself with like my, one of my shirts that has like some kind of like dad logo on or something like that, and uh, like I'll have a dad with a kid. Like, I'm always like, I'll walk up and be like, hey, man, how you doing? Everything going okay? <laughs> like, you having yeah. a good day? Like yep. just inter just interject with them just for a few few seconds, man, and just yeah. have a fun little conversation. So yeah. just yeah. a moment of sanity that you are not alone. <laughs> right, not exactly. Alone. We're in the trench. We understand. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'll get. I see you, man. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, hey, David, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, yeah. It's been seriously a lot of fun getting to talk to you, and I I guarantee we're gonna have you back on again. Danny and wow. I will make sure that takes place uh, because, like I said there's all kinds of other things to talk to you about. And I think even getting more in depth into what, what's going on with fathering together is a, a very intriguing conversation. Yeah, I'm interested itself. In that. yeah, definitely. Um, and so, yeah, we'll get, we'll get that scheduled uh, for later Sounds on. Good. Well, and I think we can do some good work together too, between home dad, uh, national home dad network and fathering together. I think oh yeah, there's definitely. A, mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, cross pollination, useful yes. cross pollination that could take mm -hmm. place there between our, between our two groups for, sure I'm, I'm certain of it i don't know what it would look like but i know it's there we oh yeah it's definitely there out. so yeah. well, i'm cool, just gonna man. say yeah. it may have been mentioned previously at a board meeting and it may be <laughs> mentioned already or going to be mentioned again already um i i know a board member and he yeah. talks a lot so um no it's me but um yeah so <laughs> it's just a matter of it's really like you said it's just absolutely the same areas that we're working together and just looking to help each other you know how can we boost your signal you know, what can we yep. do to get you, you know, more exposure or more views or whatever it might be that you need so that people know what you're doing because you're doing good stuff. Yep. So. Definitely. It's That's nice exactly to be able it. to have this time of uh, fatherhood oh, so of brotherhood. <laughs> Indeed. I like that. The brotherhood of fatherhood. The brotherhood of fatherhood. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's an awesome line. I like that a lot. Thank you for having me. I mean, I like talking to you guys anyway and uh, talk like, you know, real people, uh, beverages, you know, yep. hanging out. Uh, it's, uh, it's very cool that we're able to do this. I love this technology. It's a great time to be alive. It is. It, it really is. is. Well, hey, cheers to everybody. And, uh, we'll talk to y'all uh, next week. Have a good one. Good night, everybody. I'm a dad. That's what I do.